Hi, I'm Pastor Corey Skipper. And if you haven't met me, I'm the pastor who's going to be starting Anchor Church's newest church plant, Anchor East. And if you're joining us online here in Albuquerque or all the way in Chama, I'm so glad that you're here with us to hear from the one true God and His Word and to worship Him. I'm so excited to be here and be a part of what Anchor Church is doing, both here in Albuquerque as well as in Chama, which is ultimately reconciling humanity to himself through the gospel of Jesus. If you don't know me, uh, I've been on staff since 2020, uh, summer of 2020. Um, I heard a calling to ministry back in 2014 while I was serving, serving at a youth camp. Uh, I was praying over the students and uh, the Lord at that time pressed upon my heart pretty clearly that he was calling me to ministry. Since then, God has been faithful to provide godly men to encourage me, and uh, pr He provided me with a seminary education, and uh, also with plenty of opportunities to take advantage of and to ultimately live out what God has called me to. And if there's anything you get out of this sermon today, it's exactly that, that God is faithful to provide for His church, and that He's inviting everyone to join him in what he's doing here on earth. You see, mankind was made to be in relationship with God. And the reason for that is because, again, we're meant to be instruments in his hands doing what he wants done here on earth. He's a sending God. He's constantly sending out people, his people specifically, to reach more people with the good news of the gospel and thus redeeming more people to the kingdom of God, growing his kingdom here on earth. Today, we're going to be starting our Build Sermon series, talking about how God builds his church. And today, I get the pleasure of starting off the series and preaching the first sermon in the series, but today, I wanted to focus in on three individuals throughout the Bible that really highlight these two facts, that one, it's God's work that we're supposed to be doing, and that two, God provides every step of the way for us to do what He's calling us to do. And the three people we're going to be looking at today uh, spans quite a, a, a vast timeline here, but it starts with Adam, the first human, and then Moses, the man that God chose to use to lead Israel out of Egypt in the Exodus. And three, Jesus. And yes, this is a huge timeline, but I think it's really important that we look at this breadth of Scripture to see that God is consistent and God does not change throughout His Scriptures. So, if we flip over to Genesis, it's important that we start here, not just because it's the first book of the Bible, but also it sets the stage for how we relate to God. It sets the stage for uh, how God works with us and what's expected of us, really. So when you read Scripture, when you read Genesis, you kind of quickly realize that Scripture doesn't really convey information in the way that we want it to sometimes here in our Western culture. And all I have to say is that it's different, not less effective, it's just different. That's all. So when you read Genesis, sometimes it can be confusing. When you read chapters 1 and 2, it seems to repeat itself. However, if you study it and you look closer, that's just the structure that the Hebrew language, or that the author wanted to structure it in Hebrew. That's the way he wanted to do it. So Chapter 1 is a general statement of what happened, and chapter 2 focuses in on important events that they just told you about so you can see in better detail what happened. So, chapter 1, God creates time, space, earth, the sea, the sun, the stars, the sky, all of it. Animals, uh, plants, and we get a brief glimpse of Him creating humans. And then chapter 2, again, like I said, it zooms in in greater detail shows us what's happening. <clears throat> so chapter 2, in verse 7, after planting a garden uh, named Eden, God then 
forms the man out of the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. And the man became a living being. This is very important because as you read the account of creation, it just says that God simply created everything else. Uh, he spoke and light came into existence. He crea created the world, uh, excuse me, the earth. Uh, he created the animals, the fish, the birds, the plants and all that. But here with man and woman, as we'll see, he, they use the word form. And it's very different uh, than the rest of the creation account because now this is a lot more of an intimate word here. It's literally the word that they use to describe a putter forming clay. So, you know, it's a little bit of a play on words here. He formed out of the dust of the earth, uh, Adam, the first human. God is the potter. Man is the clay uh, being formed into pottery, if you will. But it's very important here that we see that Man is set apart from the rest of creation, starting with how it's described that man is made, but also um, the fact that in Genesis 1.27, God also says that he created man in his image. In fact, if we look at it, 1.27, it says, So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Again, so reinforcing this idea that man is different than the rest of creation. And what that means is, is that man shares some of the attributes of God. And yes, they are slightly distorted by sin now, and um, just slightly distorted. But it doesn't change the fact that we share in these attributes with God. Therefore, we are over creation. We're different. We're set apart. Uh, we're not like the rest of the animals of creation. <clears throat> and I think this is really cool here because even when you look um, when you look at the jobs that God gives man, it's even more apparent that we're set apart from the animals. If you look at Genesis, uh, excuse me, uh, if you look at Genesis, God gives man and women, the command to be fruitful and to multiply. Uh, he tells them that they are to be, to fill the earth and to subdue it, to rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on earth. So we see here the description of man is different in how they were created. He, that, excuse me, humans are created in the image of God. So they share attributes with God. They're different from other animals. Other animals do not share in those attributes. And now they're given a job. They're given dominion over the earth. And this isn't, this isn't just some abuse of dominion. It's not that humans can just do whatever they want over the earth, but they're to take care of it. They're to be stewards, literally to cultivate the garden and to take advantage of the opportunities that's there, to cultivate the land, to help the plants grow, and see how much they can grow. They're commanded to be fruitful and multiplied, like I said, so literally to create other gardeners, if you will. They have a job to do here on earth. And also what's important here to notice, if we look at Genesis chapter 2, 16 through 17, we see that, well, I'll just read it for you. It says, the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on that day you eat from it, you will certainly die. And so we see God also providing for them all sorts of food. God has provided for them on every single level, as well as instructions positively what to do, right? They're there to have dominion, they're to be fruitful and multiply, there to be stewards over the earth, but also, uh, I guess for a lack of better words at the moment, negative instructions, what they're not to do. They are not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they're set up here. They've got plenty of things to do. They've got help from God. They've got help from each other, Adam and Eve. They've got food to eat. Life's pretty good. They know what to do and what not to do. 
But since they're humans, um, <laughs> well, they fall for a lie from the serpent. Um, as we see in chapter 3, they could eat from any tree except for the one tree, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Read with me Genesis 3, 1 through 6. It says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may, uh, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden. But about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it or touch it, or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So we see here, again, they fell for these lies from the serpent. He planted that seed of doubt, if you will, in Eve and in Adam that, you know, maybe, maybe God's holding out on you. Maybe God, you know, is holding back, for, or holding back on you, and you just need to see for yourself. And they fell for it, and they ate, and they sinned against God. Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God. So, just to recap here, God literally created everything, time, space, matter, laws of physics, vegetation, animals, Adam and Eve. He told them what they could do, what they couldn't. He gave them food, he gave them a job to do, and literally, <laughs> uh, God, being the potter, told the pottery what to do, and the pottery said, you know what, I think I know better, and disobeyed the potter. The creation disobeyed the Creator. God is the one who designed everything. He made everything, and He knows best. Yet they fell for that old lie, that old trick, that, you know what, I think I know better than God. And what's God's reaction? Look with me, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And then he asked, Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So here we see God asking questions of Adam, and he's not asking them because God doesn't know. God clearly knows what happened here. And he pronounces the consequences of these sins. He, he pronounces the consequences over men, women, and the serpent as well. <clears throat> he tells the man, Adam, that now he would struggle against the land to produce food. The woman now, Eve, and all of women, would have increased pain in childbearing as well. But he also speaks to the serpent and promises of one who will come from a woman who will strike the snake with his heel, conquering sin and death. And this promise, as you read scripture, comes more and more into light until finally it's fulfilled in Jesus. But after pronouncing these consequences, God then banishes Adam and Eve from the garden. But before they leave, God does something that really shows his heart for humanity. And this, oh man, it's so easy to just gloss over this detail. And I remember when it was first pointed out to me, and it just blew my mind. Adam and Eve sewed together fig leaves to cover their nakedness. And God saw that that was not sufficient. Read real quick, Genesis 3.21 says, the Lord God made clothing from skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. So there's a couple things that are implied here. It's that one, God sacrificed an animal to atone for their sin. 
but also he wanted to provide for them. <laughs> he knew fig leaves weren't going to cut it and that they needed clothes that would work well for them. And so he provided. So if we zoom out and look at this whole account, just what we covered here today, we see a few important details that I really want to come to surface and for you to take home. And that is one, we are the creation, okay? God rules over us and tells us what we are to do. Oftentimes we think we can tell God what he needs to do for us, but we're here on earth to serve God's purposes. Adam and Eve, they were created as gardeners and they were charged with being good stewards of the earth. And we too have jobs now in light of what Jesus did on the cross. But we'll get to that in a little bit. But the second thing I want you to pull out of this is that God provides everything. God provides the direction that we're to go in. He provides the leadership. He provides us with opportunities. Everything we need in order to accomplish what he wants us to do is found in God. And I think that this story really captures that. So also does the story of Moses. I want us to look at his life in the book of Exodus real quick. Now, Moses' life is incredible, not only because of what he did, but just surely based on what happened in his lifetime. There's some really incredible things that happens in his lifetime. For very brief and quick context, uh, <clears throat> in order to survive a famine, or in order for Israel to survive a famine, God brings Israel into Egypt. And the Pharaoh at the time allowed them to live there. Years later, this Pharaoh dies, and a new Pharaoh comes to power, and he sees the tribe of Israel living within the borders of Egypt, and he sees them as a threat. In fact, he even says, what if we go to war with another nation, all Israel has to do is just join them, and then we have that many more enemies to fight with. And so this Pharaoh decides to enslave Israel, uh, to force them into slavery, and to use them for manual labor. Not only that, but also he uh, commands that all midwives kill the baby, boy, uh, baby boys born to Israelite families. This is the context that Moses is born into. And Moses, after being born, his mother could no longer hide him. And so she put him into a basket into the Nile and, you know, let God take care of it. And Pharaoh's daughter, funny enough, finds Moses and takes him into her care. She raises him uh, in the Pharaoh's house, which this means that he was given the best food, the best clothes. He was educated by the smartest people at the time in Egypt. So all things considered, Moses' upbringing was incredible. His childhood was probably phenomenal. Um, all sorts of things that many children didn't have back then. <coughs> But then the Bible picks up when Moses is an adult, and he goes out to observe the forced labor of the Israelites, and he sees an Egyptian abusing one of the Israelite slaves, and Moses looks around, makes sure he's alone, and he ends up killing the Egyptian. So out of fear, he flees from Egypt, and because uh, he knows he's going to be caught, he knows that there's no way that I can cover this up because the slaves saw it. Someone's going to discover the body. He knows he's going to be caught. So he flees to the land of Midian. And there he ends up settling down and he marries a woman named Zipporah. Here is where God meets Moses. And it's in chapter 3 of Exodus. Moses, while shepherding his father-in-law's flock, comes across a burning bush that is not consumed by the flames. And when he comes closer, he hears God call his name. And God commands him to stay back and to take off his sandals because he was standing on holy ground. Read with me Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings. And I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good land, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the territory of the Canaanites, Hittites, 
Amorites, Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites. So because the Israelites cry for their help, <clears throat> excuse me, so because the Israelites cry for help, help has come to me. Excuse me. So because the Israelites cry for help has come to me, and I've been able to see the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh, so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So, there's a couple points I want us to pull out of this, and that is one, God says he observed the misery of his people. God's not merely saying, yeah, I see it, I, I'll get to it. No, he saw it, and he's taking decisive action based on what he is seeing here. And I want us to recognize that because sometimes in the hardships of life, we can forget that, that God actually does see what is happening and he does deeply care about it and that he will bring justice to it. We may not see it, we may not understand it, but God cares and he will answer it. But the second thing I want us to notice is that God is sending Moses to act on his behalf, on God's behalf. <clears throat> so initially, upon hearing this, Moses reacts out of fear and starts coming up with these different fears that are propping up in his brain. And he starts with, well, who am I to tell Pharaoh to let his people go? Or then he goes, how will I convince Pharaoh? And who should I say sent me? So he's got all these fears and doubts, which, I mean, these make sense. These are great questions, right? If God, uh, if you were in Moses' position, I'm sure these questions would naturally come to your brain as well. But God helps Moses out by giving him miraculous signs to perform, as well as promising that he's going to be with Moses every step of the way. And finally, unfortunately, Moses complains one more time. Uh, bringing up yet another fear because he's doubtful that God can actually do this. And God is angered with Moses because Moses is complaining, well, okay, you want to use me, but I stutter. I don't speak very well. So how in the world am I supposed to accomplish this? So in God's anger, he graciously allows Moses to use Aaron as uh, Aaron being Moses' brother as a prophet of sorts. So God is saying, I'm going to send you. You are going to speak on my behalf. But because you claim you can't speak very well, I'm sending you and your brother is going to act as a prophet for you. <clears throat> so Moses finally agrees. And as Scripture goes on, it's a very long story in Exodus, but it's very good. As Scripture goes on, um, Moses obeys the commands of God each step of the way, performing miracles before Pharaoh to convince him to let Israel go. And then once Pharaoh lets them go, Moses leads the people all the way to the promised land. And unfortunately, the people doubt that God can deliver the promised land to the Israelites. They doubt that uh, though God said he was with them and that they were to go take it, that they couldn't do it. So because of their doubt, they are punished and they have to wander the desert for 40 years until that doubting generation is dead. And then they're brought back to the promised land. And then there is where Moses' life ends. And so ultimately, we see this very long lifespan of Moses, yes, making mistakes along the way, but also being obedient to what God had called him to. God was able to provide the tools that he needed to get the job done. He also provided the opportunities for Moses to take advantage of to do what God had called him to. God also provides leaders who could step up along the way and support Moses. In fact, there's even a story where God commands Moses saying, raise your staff so that as the Israelites fight in a war, that they may win, and they will win so long as his staff is held up. Will his arms begin to get tired? Well, then there's two other leaders that come and ho help hold up his arms so the staff could be raised and Israel would win the war. 
and they did end up winning that war. But again, God provided the leaders to support Moses along the way of doing what God had called him to. And as Moses' story unfolds, you really get to see God's provision every step of the way. And it's a truly incredible story to see how God provides for this man as he's obedient to God's calling. Now, the third person I want us to look at is Jesus. <clears throat> and I really want to focus in on his ministry years. Jesus being fully God and fully man is obviously obedient to God in everything. Uh, he is sinless and perfect. But I want us to notice how he interacts with others and accomplishes ministry here on earth. So let's flip on over to the Gospel of Mark. And we'll be looking at chapter 1 to begin with. But Jesus has just been baptized and is, tempted, uh, is sent into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he's tempted by the devil. And Jesus is victorious over this. Uh, but then we see Jesus beginning to invite other people to join him in what he is doing on earth. <clears throat> so go ahead and read with me. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. It says, As he, he being Jesus, passed alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fisher, or I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he, again being Jesus, saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother in a boat, putting their nets in order. Immediately, he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now, Mark's gospel is very concise, very action-based, and it's very to the point. Uh, very, very, uh, very short, no lollygagging along the way. But we see that Jesus is launching his public ministry and he's recruiting other men to join him in what he is doing. He takes his disciples and he begins healing people, casting out demons and what the Jewish uh, rulers at the time thought was most blasphemous, forgiving sins. He's also going around and teaching people about God the Father in a way that they had never heard before. He was literally changing the way that they were trying to, the, the way that they were viewing Scripture. He was bringing further revelation to the Scripture that was already there. <clears throat> and sprinkled through all of this, through all the teaching, through all the healing, through all the casting out demons, sprinkled through all that, we get accounts of Jesus specifically carving out time to spend with God in prayer. He's seeking God and his instructions on what to do so that he's sensitive to what God wants to be done. He's traveling around with 12 men, <clears throat> at least 12 men that were told of, and it's implied that there are many other uh, disciples. But they're ministering to people around at that time. They're, again, they're teaching, casting out demons, praying for people, and Jesus commissions them. He sends them out and gives them instructions on what to do. And I want you to listen to this. Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 14. He summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the road except a staff, no bread, no traveling bag, no money in their belts but to wear sandals and not to put on an extra shirt. He said to them, Wherever, or whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place does not welcome you or listen to you, when you leave there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons anointed many sick people with oil, and healed them. King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well-known. Some said John the Baptist had been raised from the dead, 
and that's why miraculous powers were at work in him. All right, so Jesus is sending these men out in pairs, and he's giving them instructions on what to do. Because ultimately, if you've read ahead, you know what's about to happen. You know that ultimately, as Jesus continues on, he's captured by authorities, crucified, resurrected, and goes back to heaven. He recognizes that his time here on earth as a created being is limited, and that he needs to start equipping these men for the work that he's trying to do, for the work that God wants to do on earth, which again is reconciling humanity to himself. So he's recruiting these men, he's equipping them, he's teaching them with practical hands-on experience, and then sending them out saying, hey, this is your job, go out and do this, and then come back and report to me. So it's not just Jesus doing all the work. He invites these men to go out and to go do the work as well. <clears throat> he sent them out trusting them to do what needs to be done. Now, if we fast forward, we see the same thing from Jesus. We're jumping through time here. Even after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, he comes back to his disciples and charges them again with the Great Commission, inviting the disciples to join again in what God is doing. Read real quick with me. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. The most famous, the Great Commission. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus is inviting them to continue the work that God has set before them. He's not just inviting them. He's literally giving them this responsibility to continue the work. So not only, not only do they have the instructions being given by Jesus here, but Jesus also promises God's going to be with them to the end of the age. So they can also reach out to God. They can pray for what needs to be done. They can seek God on a daily basis, even though Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, they no longer have him there physically with them, but they can pray to God on what needs to be done for instructions. So again, God provided the opportunities they needed to take, and it was their obedience that God was after. And through their obedience, the church was born. And ultimately, we benefit from this. Right, Because if you follow along down that long chain of believers, eventually it comes to me and you. All of these believers before us all were invited by God to join Him in what He was doing, to be faithful in spreading the gospel, to be faithful to take advantage of the opportunities in front of them, trusting that God would be faithful to grow the church to bring people to salvation. All they had to do was listen to God's instruction that He provides, take the opportunities that He provides, and join God in the work that was to be done. God is faithful to provide for His church at every step of the way, just like He provided for Adam, just like He provided for Moses, and just like He provided for Jesus and His disciples. God will provide for Anchor as he is building his church. I'm just the next guy who's being sent out. I'm starting Anchor East. And God has been faithful to provide, and he will provide for the next as well. So how does this apply to you? You who is listening to this, again, whether you're in Chama or Albuquerque, how does it apply to you? Well, we are created to join God in what He is doing. Again, which is reconciling humanity to Himself. There's no bigger job in creation than exactly this. Trust me, I've looked, right? 
Uh, it's not on Indeed. It's not on ZipRecruiter. There's no bigger job out there. This is the biggest job possible. Bringing the gospel to all nations, every tribe, tongue, nation, and people, that the kingdom of God may grow. What is God doing around you? How is he inviting you to join him? God provides us with opportunities and everything we need to do the job. We just need to be obedient. What opportunities are around you? And what step of obedience is calling you to? You know, these are all questions that if you don't have the answer to, man, you have a loving heavenly father that you can reach out to in prayer and say, God, I recognize I am the creation. You are the creator. You have a job for me. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And what opportunities are in front of me that I can take advantage of? And not take advantage of in a negative way, but opportunities that you can take in order to grow the kingdom of God, to glorify God the Father, because that's what you were created for. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this, honestly, rich word that you have provided for us, Lord. How there's so many accounts of so many people. Lord, we only looked at three, and really even that, it was like a brief five to ten minute per person look at what you have done through humanity. And yet scripture is full of so many other accounts of how, Lord, you provide everything that is needed and how you provide for the church, how you grow the church, and how you're a loving and good father who is reconciling humanity to himself. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the grace that is given us through Christ on the cross and that he was resurrected again, that we may have new life. Lord, all these things I pray in your name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. Our God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout.
and we won't be quiet. We shout.